Here we are once again. Let's get to it. Meridian is now only the latest in a line of human colonies to be hit by the Guardians, and while the UNSC figures out what to do, Blue Team has been taken to a mysterious forerunner world known only as Genesis. Upon arriving, Blue Team notices a number of Guardians arriving, wondering why they had been brought to this world. As they begin to explore the world, they find a council that, upon approach, lights up and makes the Ali Ali Oxen free tune that lore buffs will know as the Spartan 2 all clear code from the novels. I gotta say, when I first heard that, I was genuinely surprised and it brought a huge smile to my face. Getting back to the story, as John activates the council, we can see in the distance a structure that starts to, well, change. This structure is a domain gateway, something we'll talk about a little later. As they venture forward, Fred brings up the fact that awakening the Guardian on Meridian likely led to a lot of civilian casualties. While Kelly notes that Cortana may not have known, Linda isn't so sure. The Master Chief says they'll find out when they find her. Now here's probably a good place to pause and discuss Blue Team as they're presented in Halo 5. More so than Osiris, Blue Team is a fairly controversial topic. When first announced, the mere notion of finally getting to fight alongside the legendary Blue Team, and as we found out later, playing them as well, is something the entire lore community was overjoyed about. I mean, what lore fan wouldn't be excited? This is something people have been asking for since as far back as Halo 2. Further, when the voices were finally heard, at least as far as I know, people were fairly receptive. The only complaints I can remember, and I use that word very, very lightly, was Kelly having an accent and Linda's lack of one. For those who might not be aware, Linda had a South American accent in the Halo Fall of Reach audiobook. Some people were expecting that to carry over. But really, those were the only major complaints I ever came across, and again, I'm using that word very, very lightly. And those complaints were few and far between. The accent issue really only derives from the fact that, having grown up together and around people speaking in, forgive the American-centric term here, on accented English, no Spartan 2 should, theoretically, have a unique accent. But I digress. When the game finally released, people were fairly divided on the depiction of Blue Team. For me personally, I wasn't too disappointed. Fred, my favorite Spartan, period, was very well done by the legendary Travis Willingham, and Linda was also very well played by newcomer Brittany Umalele. I am almost certain I butchered that last name to hell. Apologies. But really, the only complaint I could really level at Linda was that she was a bit more talkative than she was in the books. The real issue, as far as I've seen, came down to Kelly. Her legendary speed was obviously cut down for the sake of gameplay, but it seems her personality was too. Kelly is fast not just physically, but mentally, known for her perceptibility and her dry sense of humor, both traits absent from the game. The humor, if present, was often coming from Fred. It's something I didn't really dwell on during my first playthrough, but became fairly apparent during subsequent plays. Beyond that, the family dynamic of Blue Team can feel absent at times. When it is present, such as during a few sections early in Reunion and during parts of the breaking, it's wonderful. However, it often seems to appear and disappear. I largely put this on the video game medium and the AI for the Spartans, but I could be wrong. I've seen fans take a pretty harsh tone to 343 for shortcomings regarding Blue Team, and it's hard to say that they're entirely wrong. It certainly didn't help that Frank O'Connor said that Blue Team doesn't have much personality in the books. Now, if we're to be honest, he's not entirely wrong. Blue Team do have personalities, but not as much as, say, Dr. Halsey, Jacob Keyes, Johnson, or so many other characters, and I think it's largely on purpose. When Nyland wrote the early Halo novels, he didn't need to develop the Spartans very much, and to his benefit, it worked with how they had been raised. Honestly, I think the first books to really dive into a Spartan 2's personality and character were the Kilo 5 series. That all said, the way Frankie came across almost dismissive of fan criticism was not okay. And honestly, after the narrative beauty that was Halo 4, expecting stronger personalities from the characters meant to be the central focus of Halo 5, or even some character development, is hardly asking much. Moving on with the story. After activating the first console, Blue Team sets out to find Cortana. They make some observations about the area, briefly discussing how Dr. Halsey might react, before coming across a strange and unexpected sight, the Covenant. The Covenant, along with many other things and beings, were pulled to Genesis by the Guardians. Further, as we learn through both dialogue and intel, many of these Covenants seem to think that they've finally been taken on the Great Journey. It's an interesting opportunity that I'm glad 343 took advantage of. Anyway, after killing waves of Covenant and activating a second council, Blue Team comes across a site of a massive battle, Dead Covenant and Swords of Sun Helios all around. Entering cautiously, it isn't long before they encounter the Warden Eternal. 
just as with Osiris, he reveals himself to be working with Cortana. When the chief demands he bring them to her, he refuses, wanting to... test them first. As Blue Team continues forward, the warden tries to get the chief to admit what he'll do once he finds Cortana, to which the chief answers, I've come to bring her home. If you the warden, naturally, doesn't approve, and sticks more Prometheans on the Spartans, even taking the fight to them himself. Once defeating him, Cortana finally manages to make contact and explains the situation. When the Didact ship was destroyed, it attempted an emergency slipspace jump. Would have been nice to see that ourselves in Halo 4, in fact, prior to this, we only really got a hint from a post by Catalog, two years after Halo 4 released. So, thanks 343. Anyway, according to Cortana, once in Slipspace, she found access to the Domain, and here's where we can finally discuss how the Domain might have survived. In Halo Salentium, the Librarian is told that the Domain is actually a Precursor Artifact called the Organon, a legendary artifact said to be able to control all Precursor Artifacts. As the Halos were proven to have a devastating effect on Precursor Artifacts, the Librarian feared that the same would be true of the Domain and tried to contact the Isodidact to stop him from firing the Array. She did this, having recently sealed the Ord Didact and Requiem, hoping that untold years of sleep and meditation within the Domain would cure his madness. With the Domain gone, any such hope would be eradicated. Now as we learn through the Halo 5 intel, the Domain was not destroyed, merely severely damaged, and there is precedent in the fiction to explain this. When preparing the array for firing, the Isodidact noted that it's possible that some precursor star roads that were in slipspace during the firing wouldn't be affected. Halo 5 then gives us a solid connection between the Domain and Slipspace. Thus, it is safe to conclude that, while the Domain was damaged, it survived because it does not reside in our plane of existence. And further, as it once required precursor artifacts for it to be projected throughout the galaxy, it would have become inaccessible, regardless of whether or not it survived. And so, we have a solid theory as to how the Domain survived the Array, but was unable to be accessed by the Autodidact in his meditation and cure his madness as the Librarian had hoped. Of course, we still have to connect Cortana and Genesis to the Domain. So, when the Mantle's approach was nuked, it attempted an emergency slipspace jump. Once in slipspace, Cortana, an AI on board a ship once meant to access the Domain, found her way there. But then we have to ask, why did she end up on Genesis? The answer is the Domain Gateway. While we know very little about it, it is noted as being a fairly unique construct, and it would seem to have pulled Cortana to it, acting as her primary conduit with which she can interact with the world beyond the Domain. Now obviously this is all highly speculative, and god knows I would have loved to have a comprehensive explanation of this in the game itself. I mean seriously, 343 opted to do these intel items for Halo 5, but didn't think to explain the Domain, how Cortana accessed it, and the importance of Genesis? Why? Too much of the information I just presented is from external sources, and some of it was only revealed months after Halo 5 released. 343, please, you gotta explain these things to the player. I know I once praised this game for explaining things more than Halo 4 did, and I do stand by that, but there are some serious missteps when it comes to what 343 chose to present in the intel and what is left up to the player to figure out. Anyway, while John activates the last of the consoles, Cortana explains that the Domain cured her of her Rampancy and made her, effectively, immortal. Now if you don't know, Rampancy is onset when an AI has too many synaptic connections within the AI matrix, or if you prefer, it runs out of memory. The Domain allows for limitless expansion of AI synapses, and fun fact, Dr. Halsey had once theorized a similar solution to Rampancy by creating a, quote, abstract fractal construct within Slipspace, basically a mini-domain. But anyway, by effectively being immortal, Cortana and other AI can assume the mantle of responsibility. When she explains her plan to cure disease, poverty, etc., Fred initially seems on board. John, however, notes that the Didact made it clear that the mantle was an imperial piece. Cortana then denies that her version will be anything like that, encouraging Blue Team to get to her so she can explain it better. After fighting off more Prometheans, they finally do, preparing to enter the gateway to the Domain the first organic beans to do so since the fall of the Forerunners. And here, the level ends. Reunion is a pretty good level overall, with interesting gameplay sections and some of the first real explanations for the plot. The level's dialogue is overall pretty solid, but as I just said, and like the blue team level before it, there's some important info missing. On the intel side, it's fairly favorable. There's a log of an Ungoy thinking the Great Journey has finally come, and later thinking this world is actually a punishment for his doubt since the demon shows up. 
a small bit about a UNSC soldier being pulled into Genesis from Oban. Fun fact, this being the second mention of Oban, the first from Tanaka when encountering the new knights in the first level, and the first audio logs from a very mysterious forerunner. In these first audio logs, we hear that he's trying to find a world known as Bastion, and is considering using endurance to upload his mind into the domain. Before doing so, he learns that Bastion has been moved, an act that would seemingly be impossible at this point. Recall, in the final days of the Forerunner Flood War, slipspace travel was incredibly difficult, thanks in no small part to the movement of the original Halo rings years before, and the distribution of the final array. However, with this mysterious Bastion's location confirmed, the Forerunner departs through death and domain. We'll revisit his story later on and discuss Bastion a little more then. For now, however, there's something else we need to address, an important piece of media that Halo 5 fails to address, admittedly. The unofficial story trailer and the Master Chief being declared dead. Many fans were looking forward to this happening in the game and were at a loss when it never happened, but allow me to explain. The Master Chief is declared dead, but we never see that in the game because it's never something shared with the characters we encounter. The declaration of death was for the public. Following the events on Meridian, the Chief was not only AWOL, but had taken part in an event that had left untold civilian casualties and had engaged a Spartan in combat. Most likely fearing another Biko incident, the UNSC declares the Chief dead, preserving his legend and avoiding uncomfortable questions. I can certainly appreciate the complaints about this never occurring in the game, the fact that the events depicted in the trailer are different from those in the game, but for me at least, I guess I just never really expected to see it happen. I learned a long time ago that what we see in the live action trailers isn't necessarily going to reflect what we see in the game. It's sad, but it's true. Well, that's it for this episode. Join me next time as we discuss the Sun Helios levels, the ones that seem to be either loved or hated. Until then, this has been Halo Canon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.